Well, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are so glad that you have joined us in worship today. Uh, today is our third Sunday in Advent, and we are full of joy. Uh, we're joyful because the Lord is near. Today, as we celebrate, we're going to have some Christmas uh, songs that we'll, you'll, you'll be able to celebrate with and sing to. And I, I appreciate the work that Paul Jensen has helped us with. And uh, you'll enjoy him and, and our song selections. Uh, a couple of announcements about our worship on Christmas Eve. Uh, I would love to welcome you to be here where I am today. Uh, we're going to have a candlelight service. Uh, this is at, at Gibbsboro from 7 to 7.45. Blackwood, 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock in the same kind of uh, situation. 5 o'clock to 5.45. We'll have our candlelight service. And we will worship and proclaim God who has come to us in Christ. The best news of all. And so I really hope you can be with us. So let us say our collect our prayer once more for Advent. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which thy Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, now and forever. Amen. Join us as we sing. We want to be safe, but we want to be able to enjoy the season. 
We've got work to do to put right what has gone wrong, to heal what is broken, to mend the relationships, and to prepare for the company that will come. The prophet Isaiah reminded us that there is work to be done. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. When God comes in, then healing is to be found. But we need to make the way. We need to open the door into our lives. So we light these candles as a sign of our faith, that the God we worship is not far from us, that we can clear the way for that God to come and dwell with us. We light these candles in faith that company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. So today we share in our Advent meditation on joy, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that was a joy-filled passage. In Luke chapter 3, the passage that we're going to use for our message today, it doesn't quite have that same kind of joyous ring to it. Listen to John uh, from Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, John, uh, Luke, John the Baptist says, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and, he, uh, and, and we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So that's good news, right? Verse 18, listen to what it says in verse 18. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. May God add God's blessing to the word this morning. Listen, John the Baptist, don't diminish your words or soften your warning on my account. I mean, let us know what you really think. When John the Baptist warns the followers of the nearness of Jesus and the proximity of the wrath of God, people start asking him what they're supposed to do. So filled are they with fear, they began to solicit his counsel to avoid the judgment of God. His warning is simple, stop doing the things that grieve God's heart. Bear fruit that shows repentance. That's what John says. The crowds ask him what they are to do, and he tells them, share and share alike. That's an interesting take, isn't it? The Baptist number one prescription encourages generosity and mutual sharing so that no one becomes uh, so uh, ensnared in the desperation of their poverty. 
not to be outdone. The tax collectors are the next to inquire of John. He tells them not to overcharge their tax duty. And John instructs the collectors to ignore their profit margins. In fact, the warning of John indicates that the tax collectors ought to be willing to take a loss on their investment. Now, the last group that comes to question John the Baptist are the soldiers. Even the soldiers, they say, uh, what are we supposed to do? The keepers of the peace. Notice the warning John gives to the soldiers. John knows the unscrupulous nature of bribes and paybacks and the abuses of power. And after these quick questions and answers, John completes the description of the coming of Jesus by announcing the complete judgment that Jesus would bring. Jesus brings the judgment that brings the Holy Spirit's fire, the winnowing fork that clears the, sh the threshing floor, and the fire that burns the chaff. Now, I think I can speak for you when I say that this is not the Jesus we usually have in mind. This is Jesus, uh, all, uh, as he anticipates the cross, this is Jesus, the one who tells his disciples that they will be the fisher, they'll be the fishermen of the world, and the world will be caught in the net. On this side, you see, of the crucifixion, John the Baptist characterizes the arrival of Jesus in those kinds of terms. Indeed, when you and I think of the second coming of Jesus, informed as it is by the descriptions of what may happen on God's appointed day of judgment. I mean, have you ever thought of how that day of judgment is described? I can tell you this much. We would prefer to avoid the full wrath of God, the full judgment of God as it is described. Now, I'm just going to read one passage from Joel, chapters 1 and 2, that we might, we've, they're kind of representative uh, for many. And this is the way it goes in John, or Joel 1, verse 15. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are ruined because the grain has failed. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle under, uh, wander about because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep are dazed. To you, O Lord, I cry. For fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flames have burned the trees of the field. Even the wild animals cry to you, because the watercourses are dried up, and the fire has devoured the, devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like, like blackness spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Fire devours in front of them, and behind them a flame burns. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden, but after them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses, and like war horses they charge. As with the uh, rumbling of chariots, they have the crackling of flame on tops of the mountains, devour, fire devouring the stubble, the powerful army drawn up for battle in the passages we have just read from Joel. In the passages we've seen from Jesus, we see that Jesus, too, understands that God's arrival and judgment is going to call to account the wicked and the evil so that God's kingdom can be established. We read passages of God's judgment from two points of view. We read them as a commentary on the actions of the wicked and also the sinful, and we may deem the judgment of God to be overdue. We read these passages when they refer to the future, and we think that God's holiness and God's justice will be preserved on the fearful day of the Lord. Yet rarely do we read these passages with the obvious point of reference, put your seatbelts on please, ourselves. 
it must be true that God's judgment will include and not exclude you and me. Yet it must be equally true that in Christ the judgment has been rendered. I don't know of any church group that completely abandons the judgment of God in their claims or, or in their uh, articulation of the gospel. Uh, they talk about what these last days may look like, but I also know of no church group that acknowledges that all of the statements about God's judgment, on the part of Jesus anyway, and John, were made before Good Friday. And could it be that the judge has been judged in our place so that the arrival of God to us in Jesus and the anticipation of Jesus' second arrival must not only uh, include the first judgment on Good Friday, but must also include the judgment of God upon the evil, the sin, the wickedness, the hatred, and all the rest in our world. So what do we make of John the Baptist's words here? May they be for us a call to repentance and a call to renewed worship. That was the purpose in the Baptist day. The statements that John the Baptist made occasioned all kinds of backtracking from the crowds, the tax collectors, and the soldiers. Since the Lord of glory is on God's way, and since God is prepared to render God's righteous verdict, let's call out to the Lord for His mercy, grace, and forgiveness. And we look at our own selfishness and difference and hatred square in the face. We can come to no other conclusion. We deserve the judgment of God in some manner. We might be among those who cannot see how we might deserve such austere judgment, but we're certainly those who understand that against the backdrop of God's righteousness, God's holiness, and God's glory, we, we, we don't deserve anything but the judgment of God. And in fact, just like Lent prepares for Easter, Advent is preparing for Christmas, and we're supposed to be in an attitude of repentance straight on in. But I come to this nagging point. John the Baptist and Jesus both issue these statements about the judgment of God before the crucifixion. Might it be that the Lord has already poured out judgment? A judgment that awaits the final verdict of God? Could it be? See, that's the way that the Gospel of John seems to put it. In John's Gospel, the resurrection story is followed by an epiphany story, which opens on a new creation, a new garden, and the Lord of glory walking among the faithful. Judgment has happened, but I know too that there is much in the world that I wish God would put a stop to right now. Much that calls out for the vengeance of God, for the judgment of God from corporate greed to personal sin, from bigotry and prejudice to systemic injustice. There is so much in our world that is out of step with the goodness and the grace of Christ. John the Baptist calls us to repent as individuals and also as communities. John the Baptist calls you and me to acknowledge the woeful nature of our world and encourages us to make the shifts required to honor God with our faithfulness. We're given the challenge, you see, of a new direction, and we're given the possibility of something entirely new. That is, obedience. Obedience to the Lord. The dawning of God's kingdom has begun. Too often we, we blow by this part of the gospel, but I want you to look at how John the Baptist talks. He talks from a point of view we rarely countenance. He talks as if the coming of God, the arrival of God's judgment upon us, is at the door. It's imminent. Something eternal, something dreadful, something that brings the full revelation of God is, is right in front. And by the way, that's the good news. In fact, John's work indicates that someone is at our door and knocking upon it with quiet insistence. Doesn't this help you understand the way John the Baptist talks now? How else would you assume that God might arrive at your door? If we take the scale of the biblical narrative seriously, then we come down with only one pers perspective. And, and that is, we don't deserve God's mercy and God's grace. To acknowledge any other possibility is to be engrossed in our own goodness. And I don't know how much you watch the news or read the news or, or think or, or, I mean, what do you think about what you read and hear and listen to? I just see that we must own 
the sense of our, of our broken human condition. We're lost apart from Christ. That's the whole reason for Advent. Now saying this, we can, we can see how things can so easily go off the rails for those of us who claim Christ. I can see how things can descend into evil for those who have no connection to Christ. That quiet knock on the door that John the Baptist hears echoes in the rooms of our lives and acts as a wake-up call. God has come, and maybe for the rest it doesn't quite meet the same, uh, doesn't quite do the same thing. But the Lord of the universe has come in the most unexpected ways. At once, our fears, while helpful in coordinating our humility and our repentance, are dispelled with the arrival of the one that John describes. Jesus is the one who knocks. He's the one that comes. And when we open that door, we surely welcome God's presence. God will take care of the world and its charade. God will put away the injustice and hypocrisy. God will deal with my own sin and hypocrisy and injustice. The Lord cannot abide these things. He's the Holy One, but the Lord comes to bear the judgment upon Himself because we are even ill-equipped to deal with that judgment. How will we be aware of God's coming? I heard this uh, story from a friend who was working in Princeton. He had uh, approached a corner where he had planned to cross the street and get a coffee, and he sees this unfold. Another person darted out and tried to jaywalk against the light and diagonally through the intersection. At the same time, a car came around the corner and nicked him sending the guy who's walking sprawling along the street and the car stopped and the driver jumped out to check on the man and he was picking himself up and the driver was apologizing and checking nothing seemed to be wrong and the, the jaywalker and the driver began talking amicably sharing apologies uh, jaywalkers like oh I'm so sorry I shouldn't have darted in front of the car I'm late for this appointment I can't believe I did that and then the driver is he's replying he's like I can't believe I, I I can't believe I ran into you, you know, and, and there they start talking and, hey, listen, you're, you're late. Uh, I took that turn too quick, but maybe I can just give you a ride to your appointment. And the jaywalker and the driver rode off chatting and becoming friends. That is the funniest thing. Might that be what the coming of the Lord looks like for us? We might need to be nicked as we try to run across the street. Our world sure needs to be adjusted by the justice, mercy, and forgiveness of the Lord. But ultimately, we will be brought into the car and we will ride away a father with his children. Some of us will need some corrections. Some will need adjustments. We will all need God's mercy and God's forgiveness and the knowledge that the Lord will work all things out. The world certainly needs to be adjusted and God is coming to do that in a final way. The Lord's going to gather all of us unto God's self and the Lord is rounding the corner as we sprint into the middle of the street. Now look at the last verse of the passage, verse 18. Luke says that all of this amounts to the good news. To those of us who have been grasped by God, God's imminent arrival, even in judgment, will also convey to us God's rescue. Keep saying it. John the Baptist, in our age, we could use the Lord's arrival. It's almost like we need to have the Lord show up and start banging heads together. But the Lord has arrived. He has come. And He is coming. We continue to praise the Lord. Amen. Friends, I appreciate so much you being with us, and we have been bearing one another's burdens in prayer. I, uh, I confess, I could be doing a whole lot of other things. I would rather be doing a whole lot of other things. I'd rather be praying for you and for your needs. I'd rather be uh, participating with you in more robust Bible classes and studies at such a time as this, as we uh, continue to seek the Lord's face. Uh, let me know how I can pray for you. And as we close our, our service today, will you join me as we pray? Lord, we lift up those folks that we know who are having a hard time. And Lord, they may be dealing with illnesses, with diagnoses, with tests. I know of a person who's dealing with a dad who may have uh, cancer. What a, what a 
difficult diagnosis at this time of the year, but Lord, we know all kinds of people who are dealing with firsts, with difficulties, with griefs, and I pray that you would allow them to stand in your mercy and in your comfort. Holy Spirit, come. We pray for our churches at Blackwood and Gibbsboro. May they be a beacon to those who need to hear a little good news and to see your face. And so, Lord, we lift those who are dealing with sickness and illness and pray for full healing. Pray for miracles in our midst. Pray that you would sustain us by your grace. Thank you for teaching us to pray as you've taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining with us on this third Sunday of Advent. I pray that you have a great week and let me know how I can bless you. There's a little button. You want to like the video. You want to subscribe so that you don't miss any of these stunning, uh, stunning episodes, right? Uh, go ahead and do that. Leave us a comment, especially if I can pray for you. Reach out to me personally so that I can lift you and your family in my prayers. May God bless you.